Hey guys, what's up? Apple Joe here. Today we are going to discuss the third book in the Vampire series, Blood Captain by Justin Sumper. It is raining today, hence our inside little chat slash review. Um, just so I say this correctly, the book came out in England in 2007 and the first US edition was April 2008. Alright. Blood Captain, 569 pages. Textbook size. Of pure... Confusion, heartbreak, adventure, action, blood, sweat, tears, death, life. I think I covered. I think I covered it. We're not going to read anything from from passage wise for this particular book. Now, the first two books of the Vampire series were written in a very specific way. The second one tend to jump around from story to story, and this third book had about four to five different plots going on at the same time so it jumped from place to place and when you read it gotta view it as if you're watching an episode of game of thrones that you're jumping from one story to another story to another story but it's all tied together and then characters do come together and form their own story and once you get in that mindset it's very i'm not gonna say easy because it's a very in-depth book to read in general but it's more enjoyable that way when you realize you're jumping from plot to plot to plot I had spoken with um, Justin, the author, via Twitter a little bit after I posted my um, second review. He gave me some inside scoop on uh, character names and pirate history. And thank you very much, Justin, for that, uh, for answering those questions, for answering those queries of mine. Because yeah, I was curious. I was very curious where Jez's name came from. And you even yourself had mentioned that Jez Stukeli is your favorite character of, of the six book series and it's pretty nice knowing that it's nice knowing the little inside scoop from the author themselves instead of having to come to terms or guesstimate what character is the author's favorite or like who are you most upset about killing over the duration of writing it etc so we're halfway through the series again six book series i keep looking that way because i have them on my shelf over there plot of vampires blood captain Jumps around. We start off with Connor in a crow's nest. Connor and Grace Tempest are main character twins from Crescent Moon Bay, Australia. Get washed off to sea. Grace winds up with vampires. Connor ends up with pirates aboard the Diablo. And then in the second book, he winds up at Pirate Academy, but then goes back to the Diablo. So the first, this book starts with Connor in a crow's nest on the Diablo, conquering his fears, right? And then Grace is traveling with the captain of the Nocturne, which is the pirate ship, along with Lorcan Fury and Darcy Flotsman and Shanty. Does Darcy come with them? I don't think Darcy comes with them. Shanty, Lorcan's uh, donor, blood donor, goes with them up to Sanctuary, which is the top of a mountain, and everyone's climb of the mountain is different for one reason or another. But they are there to see Mosh Zoo... Kamal, Guru Mashu Kamal, who is the vampiric guru to help cure Lorcan of his blindness and start him on feeding again. Which he doesn't actually start feeding again, fun fact, because it's not actually mentioned. But Lorcan is therefore cured of his blindness after many hundreds of pages of blood, sweat, and tears. Because a lot goes on. A lot goes on at Sanctuary. We meet this character, Johnny Desperado, who is a uh, uh, vaquero. Vaquero? I can't say it. He's a Mexican cowboy who died in Texas and became a, a vampire in the 1800s. And he is an awesome character, Johnny Desperado. The entire time of reading... Now, again, I've read this series so many times, but because I'm now thinking of it in a television series format, what actor could play Johnny Desperado? What acting could, actor could play Lorcan Fury? That I still don't know. But anytime I would read about... um. Johnny Desperado, and then Jess Stukeli, I always had an image in my mind, because the two of them, Johnny Desperado and Jess Stukeli, have an interesting uh, connection at the end of this book, which we'll get into. But I see, as I read, Johnny Desperado played by Tyler G. Posey, who is Mexican himself, half Mexican to be fair, and uh, Dylan O'Brien as Jess Stukeli. That was the actor images in my mind as I read <laughs> their stories and it's funny because those actors are well into their mid-20s and these characters are 
late teens, early 20s. So obviously the actors can't really play these teenage vampires, but it's still entertaining having that mindset and it's helpful having a visual of what you think the character actually looks like. So Tyler Posey as Johnny Desperado, this Mexican cowboy who's badass and very entertaining and a con artist in himself and tries to kill Grace at one point. But say la vie. So we meet Johnny at Sanctuary. Um, like I said, Sanctuary has, is this meditation area that uh, vampires from different eras and different places in life go to try to get some form of healing, to, to release their despair and anguish, and to also, you know, try to figure out what kind of vampire they want to be. A land-dwelling vampire, a vampire vampire. The goal is to make sure that they can feed once a week uh, for the feast night on blood and then live comfortably on the nocturne. But there's problems on the nocturne because Jez eventually gets to the nocturne thanks to the help of Bart and Connor from the Diablo. Now, you're thinking, well, we already talked about how Connor had the m images from the vampire captain to set fire to Sidario and his cruise ship to kill them all, right? So that's how the end of book two is, that they see Jez and Sidario on the ship, and they set it aflame, and everyone dies with the sinking ship. But somehow, and we actually don't go into it in this book, Sidario is still alive, and Jez is still alive. The captain and his lieutenant. But the lieutenant plays coy, and he's all like, Oh, you know, I want to change, and I need help. And he finds Bart, and he finds Connor on the Diablo. And he's like, listen, please just help me. Because it, they're the three buccaneers, right? One for all, and one for and all for one. They, they, they're going to help their fellow brother pirate, who's now a vampire, in a sense. So they take Bart and Connor, again, in the beginning of the book, takes... Uh, Jez to a place called the Blood Tavern up this little river and Jez buys his way of blood through Connor's little locket and then that's the place where we actually find out that Sidario is still alive because of Lilith who is in charge of the Blood Tavern and it's nice seeing all of these little intricate places throughout the plot and throughout the settings for instance of this of this series because it's very widespread. It's very intricate. It's very TV centric. It's very place to place to place. It's very Game of Thronesy. You're going from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom. It's very Pirates of the Caribbean. You're going from pirate port to pirate port to pirate port. It's it's cool like that. It's sleek like that. Even though it's very futuristic history, steampunk oriented, it's very cool. That's the best way to explain it. It's just very cool seeing all these different places. So like I said, Connor and Bart both get Jez to the vampire ship, beg the captain to help Jez as best as he can, but turns out Jez was working as a double agent because he therefore recruits a bunch of different vampires from the Nocturne ship to go onto Sidorio's future ship. So Sidorio comes up one night after a feast night, not even a feast night, mid midweek, um, after there's a mutiny of certain renegade vampires that a new faction is coming to play. Faction is the word used by Mash Zhu Kamal. It's hard to say his name sometimes. Um, who's trying to make sure that his va his vampires up at Sanctuary are not going to be taken away by Sidorio's faction as well. So Jez takes a group of vampires from the Nocturne onto Sidorio's ship, and then they all come to Sanctuary to recruit even more vampires. But at this point, the captain himself is done. Collapses, done and out. Darcy Flossman, the ship's figurehead, who's also a vampire by night, is... Not even freaking out, but she takes hold. She sails the ship to the to sanctuary. She climbs the mountain herself, meets up with Olivier, who is another double agent in a sense, um, who is Mashu Kamal's first assistant, who is therefore threatened because Grace Tempest is there to become a new healer, to become a new assistant, and he's like speaking to Sidario at one point, secretly in a mountaintop after Olivier and Grace go pick some berries. And he's like, listen, this girl's here to replace me. And Sidario's like, listen, you got to do something about it. Obviously, they're not talking this way. I'm summarizing as far as I need to summarize for to compute this all in my head because I'm talking very quickly. It's because so much information and so much character development is happening within this 569 page book that it's hard to just stop and take a breath. So it's better to just focus on my train of thought and keep on keeping on. Oh God, I apologize. That's a horrible saying, but I said it and so what? Here we go. So Olivier puts a lot of blood into this 
uh, berry tea, which is a blood substitute that the vampires up in Sanctuary are drinking. So by the time Sidario and Jez Stukeli, Lieutenant Stukeli, come with these new renegade vampires, this new faction of vampires that were taken from the Nocturne up to the Sanctuary, most of them are wired and bloodthirsty. So Johnny Desperado winds up trying to kill Grace by lassoing her and like he takes his lariat and lassos her and it's just a really nice scene and Lorcan's sight is cured at this point but there's a lot of backstory with Lorcan we'll get into that a little bit so a lot of chunk of the vampires come from the nocturne a lot of chunk of the vampires come from sanctuary to join on uh Sidorio's new crew of vampires but where are they going so at the end of their little story in this book we have Jez and Johnny as the two lieutenants now of Sidorio. The trifecta of these vampire dudes are just awesome. And why they're awesome is because we get a full intricate backstory of the three of them. We're introduced to Jez in the second book, but Justin has said via Twitter <laughs> that um, once a film series is actually depicted, once a television series, let's be honest, this needs to be a television series. It, as if Game of Thrones meets... Um, Pirates of the Caribbean meets the originals, which was a, it's a fantastic example of how vampires are per portrayed in a television series. If those three series, that's a great example. And the, um, what's the word? Supernatural aspect of Teen Wolf. If all of those things come together, that's what this TV series would be. Ratings through the roof, billion dollar merchandising industry. It's, it'll get there. It'll, it'll get there. I, I, I'm, I'm pushing as, as much as I can. I'm, I'm pitching to as many producers as I possibly can, but one human cannot do it alone. Everyone join in the cause. So, um, we get Jez's backstory, how he was a pirate, and he died on the ship of Dra uh, Draculus Narcissus. Is that his name? The captain from the last book. Because Captain Mo Luko Wrath is having an issue with just being himself and not following the Pirate Federation laws and all this stuff. Which is another thing we gotta talk about. A lot of stuff we gotta talk about still. We're halfway there. Roughly. So, um, we get Judge's backstory. We get Johnny's backstory because there's a thing in Sanctuary where the new vampires that go in are given these ribbons by Mashtu Kamal. Um, and the point of the ribbon is to channel whatever bad stuff you've done, whatever things you're holding in into the ribbons that way you can let it go so there's like a hall of ribbons so it's a cute little intricate way of like letting go but like realizing that is your past so it's still a part of you but it's like just there like there's a hall of ribbons so like at one point shanty who is lorkin's donor and grace are in the hall of ribbons and shanty steals some ribbons and gives grace a ribbon and gives herself a ribbon and shanty winds up trying to kill grace even though she's only getting images of whatever vampire her ribbon is attached to because she put it in her hair, but then Grace's ribbon was under her pillow, so she's dreaming about this guy who's this Mexican cowboy, and it turns out it's Johnny, and she eventually meets Johnny, and Johnny knows that he, she read his ribbon, and then they're slightly friends for a bit, but then Johnny tries to kill her because Olivier laced his blood, his laced his berry tea with blood, and then that's why Johnny eventually went, and Olivia eventually went with uh, uh, Sandario and Stu Kelly. That closes that little plot okay so connor in in this bit is a part of um the the dia the diablo right maluco rath's ship is the diablo we meet um barbaro rath who is uh, another rath brother because we have maluco rath we have Bar barbaro rath we have per per porfirio porfirio rath i can't say his name um porfirio is the Pirate captain who Sidario and Jez and company um, attacked and killed. Even though Jez claims he didn't kill him, but I'm pretty sure he did. So Barbaro uh, gets in contact with Barbaro and his wife Trophy and their son Moonshine Wrath. Moonshine Wrath! Okay, we'll talk about him. I love Moonshine. Um, meet up with Captain Maluko Wrath and company of the Diablo at Ma Kettle's Tavern, right? Because that's where everyone goes after a good raid, Ma Kettle's Tavern. Barbro wants to kill all the vampires, but then Connor's like, no, not all the vampires are bad. And then Maluko's like, yeah, like... Maluko goes back and forth all the time with his view on vampires, but... Say la vie. So they eventually there for... 
I, I, I'm lo oh, I'm making up words. I'm sorry. <laughs> Barbaro um, wants the revenge, but Maluka's like, no, let's try to like defuse the situation and propose a raid. So they propose a raid for this like fake emperor's like palace or whatever fort, the Sunset Fort. So they go t take the stuff from the Sunset Fort, pretending that they are uh, a moving crew. Uh, the ocean something, I forget the name. Um, so they take all the stuff, but then Moonshine, who is Maluko's nephew, who is Barbaro's son, Barbaro and Trophy's son, Moonshine Rath, the pirate prince, as they call him, uh, decides to pocket some coins or jewels or whatever, and then the whole plan is just gone to hell, and then Kate, uh, Deputy Captain Kate, uh, who or orchestrated the entire raid, if you will. She winds up killing one security guard. Connor winds up killing another security guard because the security guard tried to kill Moonshine, but Connor's main goal, main objective, his duty, for for instance, for the raid, was to make to protect Moonshine at all costs because he's the pirate prince. So Connor kills him, kills this guy, Alessandro, and he is freaking the freak out. Connor has been very open in the last two books about how he enjoys the sport aspect the athleticism of sword fight but he's not comfortable with the killing aspect when he first uh was facing two renegade pirates in Maluko Rath's cabin in book one who were hiding in two vases he disarmed them he hurt them he didn't kill them he then went to another ship he sliced someone this someone hit their head Connor took someone's shirt or handkerchief and made that person hold the back of their head so they didn't bleed out Connor is very sensitive but he's very all over the place because he wants to be a pirate, but he doesn't want to be a pirate. But then it's like, what kind of pirate does he want to be? So once Connor kills Alessandro, Barbara Rath gives him a little wooden man carved out of wood with some blood on the heart. It turns out it's Barbara's blood on the heart. It's a little trinket called the Blood Captain. Blood Captain, right? But it has a double meaning. So once a young pirate makes their first kill, they're given a blood captain to, to, to celebrate. So then Connor freaks the freak out, and he's not comfortable, and he is so guilty. So he writes a note. He says to Maluko, I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. He sends a note to uh, Grace, his sister, but his sister is up in Sanctuary, so there's no way of getting that note to her. So he steals a boat, and he rides off into the sunset. Excuse me, sails off into the dark. And he rips up the note and he throws it in the water and then Grace has a vision and she sees it and she puts the note together and she knows something's wrong with Connor and she needs to help Connor as best as she can. So Mashu Kamal teaches her a little way to like help Connor but like not fully help Connor because Connor has to come to terms with himself and he can't do everything by himself. And that's why the captain is in the condition the captain is of the vampire ship because he has been taking on too many people's problems for far too long and it finally made him collapse and go to sanctuary. We'll get to that in a bit. So, Connor eventually winds up back at Pirate Academy, but Pirate Academy hasn't seen Connor since Connor left because after Jacoby Blunt, one of Connor's best friends at that moment, um, betrayed him and sliced him in a du in a duel in a, what is it called? Lagoon of Doom? Doom Lagoon? Lagoon of Doom, I think is what it's called. So, Chang Li, who is the deputy captain of the Diablo in the very first book, who actually saved Connor from the water that, that he was drowning in once the yacht once the boat that um, Grace and Connor were in sank in that storm because Grace was therefore saved by Lorcan onto the vampire ship. We talked about that. So, Cheng Li is a part of the Pirate Federation. Uh, Headmaster Commodore John Kuo is also a part of the Pirate Federation. Cheng Li and John Kuo wanted Jacoby Blunt to test Connor's athleticism in an actual duel. That's all it was. But Connor didn't like the loyalty being broken, so that's why he went straight to the Diablo instead of into the Pirate Federation, instead of keeping a full-time scholarship that was offered to him at the Pirate Academy. So, Connor goes back to the Pirate Academy in this boat, and he winds up stumbling across Jacoby Blunt and Jasmine, who are now kind of dating at this point, um, but they're also skinny dipping in the water that Connor happens to be sailing into. So Connor's trying to hide so that way they don't see him. And then Jacoby's like, hey, there's a boat over there where there shouldn't be a boat on the dock. And he's like, let's go see what the boat is. So then Jacoby comes and swims over and he like pulls his naked self up into the boat and he lands on Connor. 
And <laughs> it's just this funny moment between the two of them. So they're like, oh, hey, haven't seen you since I tried to not kill you. And he's like, yeah, like, I'm still mad about that. So, like, they kind of reconcile that little tiff as Jacoby is naked. And Jasmine, obviously, is covering herself up with the boat so she doesn't come out of the water. And what's fun about how Justin writes is that this book is 500 years in the future, right? Sexual fluidity... Uh, an appreciation of aesthetics is very predominant within this book, within this series. Justin's talked about um, vampire vampires being paired with same-sex uh, donors, dancing with same-sex partners, male to male, female to female, male to female. Doesn't matter. So it's a nice, beautiful, intricate. It's not even intricate. It's just this is just common. People can express themselves freely, and people are allowed to express themselves freely because there's no judgment. You are who you are. You like who you like. Who the hell cares? And it's nice seeing that. So it's funny having this little moment of Connor staring at Jacoby's naked body, saying, "Listen, um, I need you to put clothes on because I'm having an inferiority complex staring at your abs." And it's just funny. It's funny having these characters interact with each other in just a fun, playful manner. Nothing aside from the fact it's just, it's just how it is. It's fun. It's nice seeing the acceptance of it. So Connor obviously, you know, likes sugar pie at Ma Kettle's Tavern, but he also kind of likes Jasmine. But in this brief moment, he kind of likes Jacoby. I mean, he's just admiring aesthetics, true. But again, it goes with the whole sexual fluidity of most of the characters that we've been introduced to, depending on the time frame that they were born. Um, no one gives a shit anymore. And that's, that's cool. I like that. I like seeing that in a futuristic book, as it should be as it will be. So, Jacoby and Jasmine help Connor get to Chang Lee's room because Ch Connor needs to talk to Chang Lee about what he did, how he feels about he's guilty, killing someone, what does he do, how does he become another, how does he become a pirate? How does he stay a pirate when he threw his sword in the ocean and he feels guilty about killing someone for the very first time? So Chang Lee, it turns out Chang Lee is getting her own pirate ship and Chang Lee is going to this place called Lin Landau, L-A-N-D-A-O, I think, I think I spelled that right in my head, um, to pick up the weapons that she ordered from this master, you know, forger, weapons maker. So, uh, Master Yin, or Mr. Yin, however you want to say it. Last name is Yin, Y, -Y I N. Yin, um, therefore, welcomes Connor and Chang Li, who go to sail the two days. Connor does talk to Chang Li about what happened and she gives him this perspective of, listen, you're not supposed to feel not guilty. You should feel guilty because it shouldn't, you shouldn't be killing people for unnecessary reasons. And that's goes, that goes with what Connor has been, been toying with. Why is it that he had to kill that man in order to protect Moonshine? If Moonshine didn't take those jewels, then he wouldn't have had to kill Alessandro. It's just this thing. So Chang Li's explaining that, yes, she's killed a bunch of people for necessary reasons, not for unnecessary reasons, to keep the checks and balances. Maluko Rath of the Diablo, who Connor has signed his articles to, is out of control and kills for unnecessary reasons. This would be an example of that unnecessary kill. So that's why Connor feels guilty and he can't shake it because he didn't need to kill Alessandro if Moonshine didn't break protocol. So Chang Li and Connor talk about that for two days on a ship, go to um, pick up the weapons. They meet the forger's daughter, Bo Yin, who is, again, this is hysterical because for a long time, I've always assimilated this book series with Avatar The Last Airbender and Avatar Legend of Korra. It's the same concept of traveling the world to find yourself in different adventures in different places. But a main character in Legend of Korra, who's an earthbender, his name is Bo Lin. Here we have a character named Bo Yin. One's male, one's female. But still, it's fun. I like seeing the similarities of different storytellers. It's really cool getting to see those similarities and actually talk about the similarities. And that's what not a lot of people can do. But I'm very fortunate enough that I can do that. I can see the similarities between different works of fiction and put them together to say, ah, oh, this is why all of these things together are amazing and why we should all cherish them appropriately. And then why other things suck and should just be forgotten into time. So, um, Chang Ling tells Connor that she would like him to be a part of her crew, but he needs to make amends with Maluko. So, Connor eventually finds Maluko, Rath, and company at Ma Kettle's Tavern, 
go figure, right? And uh, talks to Maluko, and Maluko is pissed off that Connor obviously wants to leave the crew, but he winds up burning the articles, which is a piece of paper, and then Connor is free to join Chang Li's crew as needed. So then Chang Li, um, I mean, eventually we'll, we'll see what happens with her ship. We'll see what happens with her crew. We'll talk about those as the other books go on. The last thing we see of Connor and Grace coming together, Connor finds himself at Sanctuary and um, they need to help the captain with Darcy and Morgan, who's got his sight back, and Mashu Kamal. So the f five of them are working to get the captain better again but what's wrong with the captain turns out the captain is this soul collector that he has taken on the pain and anguish of so many people that he's actually absorbed the souls of so many people who have gone on so Mashu Kamal is trying to release these souls to get the captain actually back so nine souls come out of the captain and then the very last soul manifests and becomes an actual being again in front of them Sally Sally has the same green eyes that Connor and Grace have. Turns out, the mother of Connor and Grace Tempest has been inside the captain this entire time that we have been reading these three books. Interesting. Very interesting. The supernatural aspect about this vampire and pirate world, 500 years in the future, mixed with a lot of science involved anyway, and a lot of Reiki, a lot of astral projection, a lot of prana talk. Awesome. And to have the, the captain absorb these lost souls and for the m mother of Grace and Connor Tempest to be one of those lost souls. See, Lorcan was hiding a secret this entire time because Grace actually took Lorcan's ribbon. Lorcan has known Grace and Connor Tempest since they were babies. And now we see Grace and Connor's mom come from the captain. So the questions are, is Grace and Connor's mom a vampire? Is she a vampirate? Is she mortal? How long has she been in the captain? What is she doing after she gets out of the captain? Will she remain an actual physical being because she's now out of the captain? Because her soul is back. So it's cool seeing these different things, very similar to what we're seeing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You see Thanos having this mindset of he wants to help the universe because there's too many people in the universe and not everyone can thrive. So by the snap of his fingers, half the people and animals will be gone in the universe. Sidorio has a similar mindset. He wants to help people in his fashion. Sidorio wants to be a captain of a vessel, who again, we talked about in the beginning of this review. Sidorio gets Jez and uh, Johnny to a uh, prison ship, and they take over the prison ship, and um, the prison ship is then named Blood Captain. Another thing, <laughs> another tie-in of the word Blood Captain. Two tie-ins. Two tie-ins. It's hard to feel anger towards what Sidario says and does because he doesn't want vampires to feed once a night, once a week. He, he doesn't like this feast concept. He feels that vampires are these eternal beings that should be allowed to express themselves freely. Be yourself. And he was preaching the hell out of be yourself throughout the pirate ship, throughout, throughout the prison ship, which became another vampire ship called the Blood Captain. You can't hate Sidario for that. Sidario just wants people to be themselves. He wants vampires to be themselves, not these leashed animals. So you see the, you see the concept Sidario has, and you see the concept Mashu Kamal has, that it's best to be, you know, comfortable with yourself, too, that you don't need blood, that you can still be immortal and you can still make a difference, but you don't need to be wrath of, you know, just a complete wrath of destruction and just maul people to death. But Sidorio has the concept, and Jez has proven that, that if you take more blood, you are capable, you're unlocking more powers of your vampirism, of your eternal life. You can do somersaults, and you can jump from high buildings, and you can do all these things, but that's only if you have enough blood in your system. So it's, you see both sides of the spectrum beautifully. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing work that Justin's done to see both sides of this, of this spectrum of, Taking more blood versus not taking more blood. It's great. It's a very well done series. Now, I, I've, I covered everything, but we're going to jump back to Moonshine Wrath. Moonshine Wrath is a pain in the ass. Let's, let's call a spade a spade, right? Pain in the ass. But I remember when I first read this book, what? 10 years ago? What did I say? 2008 is when the first one came out? Something like that. Around 10 years ago is probably when I first read this book for the first time. And 
Um, one of my favorite authors is Rick Riordan, who writes the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books, the Heroes of Olympus books, the King Chronicles, the Trials of Apollo, and Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard. All tied in together, all different mythologies mixed in together, Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Norse, right? But they also talk about Irish, they also talk about Hindu, talk about Mexican, which is really Mayan. They talk about all different mythologies of the gods being real in modern times. Okay? Whatever. But there's a character in all of the series that is referenced here and there. Nico D'Angelo, the son of Hades. Also Pluto. Right? Hades is the Greek. Pluto is the Roman. But while reading this book, I always seen parts of Moonshine in Nico and parts of Nico in Moonshine. Obviously, they're different characters, but a lot of the aspects of this guarded, insecure douchebag come through on both both aspects. And it's nice to see the character development. We're not going to talk about the character development of Moonshine just yet, but we'll talk about the character development of Nico very super briefly since we're not actually talking about those books. But Nico is this closeted gay kid who is forced to express who he has had a crush on this entire time because Cupid is just a horrible, horrible god and forces him to say the torment in order to get a key to unlock some, or was it a sword? Something. It's another intricate plot series. We'll, we'll talk about those books at some other time. But, um... The character development. Nico was very this innocent little boy who then had a crush on Percy, who then had to face his fears and then wound up killing massive amounts of people and travels to the underworld all the time and who becomes a very pivotal character in dis defeating the Titans. And it's it's nice seeing that character development of this character who was guarded at a very young age, who has become still slightly guarded, still an emo kid, but like can fight when he needs to. Moonshine, when we first are introduced with Moonshine, is a guarded kid, but who's a jackass? Who's a pain in the ass? So we get some slight little backstory of Moonshine. We we, we, we start to feel him. Connor actually has to inter, uh, inter, interact with Moonshine a lot, and Connor feels for Moonshine at some points, and then he wants him beaten at other points. That's fine. You're allowed to do that. But years ago, I always associated Moonshine and Nico as this very similar character. The same black-wearing, you know, very pale kid who's just trying to find his place in the world. And it's nice, again, comparing the different stories together, showing the similarities of certain characters and stuff like that. One final thing we'll talk about is why Connor Tempest is one of the greatest characters ever written. That I have ever... I've, I've read a bunch of things. I've read a bunch of book series. I've watched a ton of TV series. I've read a ton of comics. I have watched a ton of film series. Connor Tempest is one of the greatest well-rounded characters that I have ever been privileged to come across. Because he is not afraid to express himself. Connor is very active. He's very energetic. He's very noble. He is loyal. He's kind, he's courteous, he's collective. He is not afraid to show his emotions. So many times did Connor Tempest, Connor mother effing Tempest, cried his eyes out in this book. And that's amazing to show the character development that someone is so comfortable enough with themselves that they can hug someone in a non-huggable aspect. That they can cry in front of someone who is not used to someone crying in front of them. Connor is very comfortable with himself, but he's also terrified with himself. He's terrified with the fact that he killed someone, but he's comfortable enough to confess that he killed someone, that he needs to figure out how to live with the fact that he killed someone, that he can cry because he killed someone. Amazing. And more amazing stuff to come. We have three other books to read, four, five, and six of the Vampire book series. I... I I, I feel like I should be a historian on these books. I don't know how long I have been talking. It has been a long time. I know that. And I haven't had that much time to breathe. 569 pages of this book comparing to so many other aspects. And I am exhausted right now. You see my energy level? I need coffee immediately. I, I'm amazed with how Justin writes these intricate plots in a very future yet historical steampunk setting with supernatural parts, with sci-fi parts with real world questions 
Who am I? Where's my purpose? Where do I belong? And on Sidario's aspect, all you need to do is be yourself. Who would have thought I would be supporting both the protagonists and the antagonists at the same time? In what book series do you do that? Do you have equal parts of protagonist and antagonist that you need to honor and cherish? Aside from Prince Zuko of the Last Airbender series, because he is... That's what these tattoos are from, these elemental tattoos. Greatest example of antagonist becoming a protagonist. It doesn't happen often, and that's where great writing comes into play. Justin's mind is very intricate, and it's very poetic when it comes to certain justices that need to be seen. He goes into a lot of history, even, even an actual pirate history from the 18th century, from the 17th century. We go into a lot of pirate history within these books that are real, that aren't fictitious. So it's amazing to have nonfiction brought into fiction, historical fiction. That's why I kept saying a future history, because these books are taking place in the year 2500. 2500s, because some time has passed since our teenage heroines, heroes and heroine, hero and heroine, Connor and Grace Tempest come into play. Connor Tempest, man. Who, who would have thought? Awesome. Awesome character. I think that's about it. I have talked so much, and rightfully so, because so much has gone on, and so much is more left to come. What happens next? Stay tuned. <laughs> Mucho mal, guys.